talk about um, why I think we should possibly get back to some basics. So I'm not trying to put a bit of a downer on it, but I think all of these aspirations to change the world are wonderful, and I think they're all critical, but I think they're a subset of a more meaningful um, uh, improvement that we can make, which is just to work on delivering basically good human experience. Um, I've been involved in marketing for 30 years, which ages me considerably, and uh, I remember when I had my first job in marketing, we used to get this thing, which was a tracking study, which looked at um, brand trust, and at the time, uh, brands were, I think, way more trusted than every institution, certainly in the UK, and also right up there with church and government. Um, as most of us know, uh, there has been a significant reversal in that, um, year-on-year -year trends looking at brand trust, brand awareness, brand saliency. Every single metric you can look at shows a year-on-year -year decline. Um, and in fact, uh, almost everything that we're doing seems to be going south at the moment. So I'm going to explain why I think that's happening and what I think we need to do about it and build my case for what better marketing means, means to me. So as I've said, I'm not here to in any way uh, dampen the other three uh, speakers' pitches, because I think they're all absolutely right, so I would vote for all of them. I'm just here to say that I think there's some fundaments that we need to focus on. And I'm slightly worried, given that some of the foundations of marketing are wrong, that making loftier claims, consumers are very smart, humans are very smart, making loftier claims for our brands without the foundations being in place can backfire. And most of you will have seen or read about brands that have kind of really gone in with good intention to sort of challenge the status quo, whether it be the world, whether it be the web, whether it be any stereotype, but actually consumers see through it because they're like, no, 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 I don't believe you. I don't believe you're like that. Your role in my life isn't important. You're not meaningful and I don't trust you. So we need to get to the heart of where this disconnect is really taking place. And it's interesting, you know, we've talked about the power of the web and I'm a huge, huge advocate of all the work these guys are doing. But I think in terms of marketing, um, the digital world disruption has been immense. There's a myriad of factors that have messed with the way we are building relationships with human beings. And a lot of these are triggered and caused by things that we've seen that have taken, opportunities that have arisen for us driven by technology. And the biggest schism that I see of, of all the problems we're facing as marketers is this uh, digital world expectation. Consumers' expectations have changed massively and ours haven't, you know, we just see them as new ways to reach and bombard people. And I think the great shame of marketing in the digital age is it should have been the period where we really understood humanity, where we put people first, where we had open dialogue with people, where we majestically pushed the relationships we've got forward. Instead, we've become absolutely obsessed with persuasion and manipulation which are two of the skills that marketers learn, but I would argue two of the least useful skills for humanity in, in general. And what I mean by this is all of the opportunities that we've created, in my view, are a runaway train to create more action-based marketing models that 100%, as per the presentation earlier, distress humans. Yet we keep doing it. We keep throwing more and more money into these um, activities, utilizing new technologies like they're just new tools to trip people up, new algorithms to give people services and products that they don't want, obsessing about short-term effects and forgetting the fact that we were trying to build meaningful long-term relationships with the people that we love who use our products and services. So where are we today? Well, I would argue that we've created a massive human experience gap between how people want to be treated by brands and how brands choose to treat people, and that isn't good. And that's why I was quite comfortable taking, if you like, the weak slot on this, you know, not really going for any of the new issues that we're faced with and getting back to some basics and saying, you know, without the foundation of a brilliant human experience, how can you expect to transcend marketing as a category? How can you challenge politicians when we're as untrustworthy as a lot of the politicians? We behave as erratically as Trump on some days. I was trying to think of some analogies just to fuel this debate a little bit further. Um, here's three stereotypes that we'll recognize in humanity. The first one is my friend who I get on extremely well with until he starts drinking. When he starts drinking, he does really, really strange things. 
Um, he has one too many Matthias Roses, and he becomes a different person altogether. He's genuinely quite schizophrenic. And as a result of that, I don't like going out with him. Even though he's one of my really good friends, during the day, great. In the evening, I don't like going out with him. We do this every day of the week. We behave in a schizophrenic way. We build brands, we put our brands on pedestals, we build images and dreams, and then we shatter them through the way we chase people around the web disrespectfully, tripping people up, bombarding them, the, the example from the journalist from the Washington Post, doing things only a drunk schizophrenic would do. We all do it, week in, week out. So the second stereotype I was gonna focus on is the flash guy. So I, I have a friend who unfortunately has more money than sense. He thought it was really funny uh, to post on his social feed when he bought a Ferrari, the unwrapping of a Ferrari. I happen to know that of his several hundreds, maybe thousands of friends, 99% of them thought he was an absolute cock for doing that. <laughs> but are we flash salesmen as marketers? We are 100% flash salesmen. We love selling bright, new, shiny things, whether people want it or not. We don't take the time to ask them whether they want the fifth blade on the razor. Do they want it? I don't know. We don't ask them. We just say, we've got it, and it's brilliant. We also offer people aspirational products they can't afford. We know they can't afford them, but we keep bombarding them with them. We start discounting our products in front of their eyes in real time. We're like, we know you can't afford that, but what if we take 10% off? What if we take 20% 20, 20 off? We are flash salesmen, we are chancers, and we are eroding this experience with the consumer. We also sell anything to anybody at any time. We think it's entirely appropriate to use all of these new levers and new channels to just constantly remind people that they need to engage with us. And we think that that's really, really smart. So, you know, we're the person that comes to you in the pub and says, do you want a new watch? Do you want anything else new? Do you want a new, because I've got everything you need. And we do that uh, a lot. And then the, first step, the last personal stereotype that we do is we talk to people, we don't listen to them. And we, whichever marketing model you look at, Talking at people is our predominant source. So the reason I can evidence and prove this is one of the things, we, we did some research into what humans want from brands, and one of the things they really, really, really want is somebody to talk to. And they also really, really, really want, when something goes wrong, somebody to help them with a problem. How much marketing prioritization goes into that part of the relationship? Next to none, I'm telling you now, and I've worked with nearly everybody in this room over the years, next to none, we are constantly addressing the message we want to give to people, not thinking about the message they want to receive from us. Now, this is kind of interesting, and the reason I'm building my case around human experience is I'm going to present you with some st statistics now. So when consumers feel they're being treated like humans, which you could argue is not an unreasonable thing to desire, they are 56% more likely to spend money with you. So you're instantly opening the valve to greater commercial success. Forrester have just issued another big report to supplement this that says they're also twice as likely to love you, they're twice as likely to be satisfied by your service, and twice as likely to be recommended. Now, we all live in empirical companies where numbers and statistics support our job. Against that evidence, surely being human has got to be the number one priority for marketers. These are business changing outcomes. Anybody who behaves in a human way is gonna succeed, yet we relentlessly don't do that. We all want to be irresistible. We all want to be forgivable, and forgivable, trust me, this is one of the key things, because we're all gonna make mistakes, but we desperately wanna be forgivable. And ideally, we wanna be irreplaceable, irreplaceable. I did a talk last week or the week before in South by when he was in Thailand, I was in Austin, and I talked about uh, um, brand obsolescence as a subject. I said that I'm worried that we're in a race to the bottom as marketers, that our commoditization of our products and services, the way we deliver them in frictionless sales environments, in a one-click mentality, is gonna drive us out of business. We need to understand that we need to build meaningful long-term experiences with consumers, and that's the only way we're gonna do it. And we obsess about it so much that we, uh, did this uh, study, which I'm not going to go into, but we looked at the ingredients of brands who are achieving more and more by being more and more human, and many of them actually Paul covered in his presentation. But uh, what we found was really getting under the skin of how to build more interesting human relationships should be our single preoccupation and our focus as marketing professionals. 
And one quite challenging chart, and I, I, I put it, I thought, no, it's obvious, and I thought, no, it's quite challenging, is I think we, we all have to be human first and brand second. We need to sort of work out our place in society, work out what we want to do with key people, work out what we want to do in culture more broadly, and maybe with the world, if we're going to help resolve problems, and then think about our branding and our messaging once we've got our position straight in terms of treating humans better. So Forrester, I'm on the home stretch now, but Forrester um, did some research recently. You can find it online, you just have to search, it's called How Human Is Your Brand? It's very easy to find. It's a good study, I had nothing to do with it at all. But they identified four of the most important human qualities that we look for in friends and vis-a-vis -vis we also look for in brands. Um, the first one is being personal. Um, and I did, I supplemented this Forrester research with some very quick qualitative research, just spoke to a load of people to ask them which brands they felt exhibited personal advice the best. So Fitbit, I don't use it, obviously I'm slightly overweight, but um, Fitbit, <laughs> sniggering in the front there. Um, but, you know, people were saying Fitbit keep me on track, they know me better than myself, they support me with nudges and milestones to make my life better. Fantastic, right? So a highly personal brand. The second, uh, the second human quality that we look for is consideration. Loads of people still talk hugely positively about Dove fighting to represent women in the very best way that they can. And they are very, very highly regarded when you think about considerate brands. Emotional, you know, loads of brands have played in this space over the years. Johnson's Baby, No More Tears, always touching our hearts, making us cry through their communication, but incredibly emotional in their orientation. And then finally, natural. Um, more and more brands, not only being natural in their product and their service, but actually in their language and the causes that they're taking on. And Paul and I have talked about this brand a lot. You know, they're, they're actually hell-bent on stopping animal testing, and they go to any length to do that. So just to supplement this on my way out, what my argument is, brand humanity is won or lost with every single action we take as marketers. And many of the actions we take are not considered enough for humans. It's nothing to do with me, this is for real people. We don't think about them. So I'm now gonna give you a list of attributes, human attributes, that again are from this Forrester report. These are important human attributes that we look for in our friends, our family, and people we care about. We want them to be responsive, we want them to be social, we want them to be friendly, thoughtful helpful, personable, intelligent, honest, and reassuring. So what I did very quickly, qualitatively, was I looked at brands. I, I sent this questionnaire out. I said, tell me brands that are doing well against these attributes and tell me brands that are doing badly. And this is literally based on qualitative snapshot research. Interestingly, not surprisingly, Amazon. You know, people love Amazon. It's highly responsive. It follows their needs. Nike, incredibly social, supporting athletes with all sorts of apps, didn't bother with friendly. Thoughtful, interestingly, Apple, one of the brands we all love, you know, we've talked about at marketing conferences for years, highly unthoughtful, I was quite interested in that, so I probed a little bit further. Um, the, the, peop the people who talked about it as being an unthoughtful brand saying anybody who has planned obsolescence built into an expensive product is unthoughtful. So anybody who charges me a thousand pounds for a product is gonna fall apart in two years. That is an unthoughtful brand behavior. I thought, well, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Honest, Volvo. So this is interesting. So the, any of you who followed Volvo at the Motor Show last week or the week before, they've done a hell of a lot around being one of the most honest companies on the planet. So what they announced at the Motor Show is they, their, their ambition or their purpose is that no one will be killed or seriously injured in a Volvo by the end of the decade. That's their commitment. And they're doing very, very, very serious, honest things to support this. They are capping the speed that their cars can go at. So nobody in Germany, looking at Alex in the front here, will buy a Volvo ever again because they all drive 200 miles an hour. So they're capping the speed of a Volvo at 112 miles an hour. No Volvo will go faster than that. They're also uh, putting uh, uh, fenced brakes on speed around schools. Incredible, incredibly honest, decent thing for a company to do. So, my argument, to finish, got 46 seconds left, see, well, I was worried I was gonna waffle on a bit too much, but is that the way we should be thinking about marketing is singularly around human experience. We should be laboring the point, you know, what are we doing that is gonna make humans feel better? 
Um, then we have to think about how that cascades out into the way that consumers consume our products and the culture around it. And I wonder, maybe this is a bit maybe arrogant, hopefully not, whether we as marketeers need a, our own single-minded purpose. And I was trying to come up with one, which is work needs a lot of work in progress, but because uh, I'm not a copywriter. But I wondered if we as marketers said, our ambition is to help people lead longer, happier, healthier, and more informed lives through delivering more meaningful human experiences, whether that would be such a bad thing. So thank you. Thank you.